and thank you for allowing me to speak to you this morning. Actually, it's true, I run the, the Shift project, which is now a fairly influential think tank in France. Our aim is to launch coherent conversation, conversations on the energy transition and the ways and means to exit from fossil fuels as a society. How can we concretely achieve this historic feat of doing without fossil fuels within only one generation? Our approach at the SHIP project is to look at the economy as just another physical phenomenon. In short, we believe that the problem posed, the tragedy that we have to avoid, is first and foremost a physical problem, then a technical one, and then, and then only, an economic problem. To put it plainly, where the conversation is almost always posed in terms of euros or dollars, at the SHIP project we believe it's essential to start with objective physical quantities, and money is not one of those. That is to say, joules, or watts, if you prefer, tons of stuff, and last but not least, people, three objectivable, objectifiable uh, physical quantities, energy, matter, and people. Looking at the problem this way, as being first and foremost a physical and technical one, before being an economic problem, leads to, we believe, very clear answers. First of all, the diagnosis. Whether you're very pro-renewables, or very pro-nuclear energy, or very pro-whatever you want, it's highly unlikely that we'll be able to replace oil, gas, and coal with any alternative at the same level of consumption. At the same level of consumption. There's a fundamental, fundamental sorry, reason for this. Mankind actually never chose fossil fuels a century and a half ago. Fossil fuels imposed themselves on us simply because they were the most convenient source of energy we had on hand. Oil, gas, and coal combine incomparable natural properties. This very fact, the incomparable natural properties of fossil fuels, shows that the problem is ecological, in other words, in other words, physical and technical before it is an economic one. Our main conclusion today, which has a significant impact, impact on the way the problem is now being considered in France, in particular by the General Secretariat for Ecological Planning, recently created under the ages of the Prime Minister in France. This conclusion is this, we won't get out of this mess, we won't protect ourselves against the historic tragedy that is global warming with the business as usual tools of conventional economics. The Shift project has recently done much to promote the idea in France that we need to reinstitute the tools of industrial planning and policy. Those tools were developed in France in particular after second world, the Second World War, when for instance they were no longer a bridge between Le Havre and Paris. These tools were developed from uh, 1946 onwards by great men such as Jean Monnet, one of the fathers of the European Union, in a world then bound for unprecedented economic growth. What in France is now called the Trente Glorieuse, the glorious 30 years between World War II and the oil shock of 1973. This period of unprecedented growth was the result of a situation of unprecedented energy abundance, made possible first and foremost by crude oil. It's no coincidence that this period came to an end with the first oil shock. This time, this time, on the contrary, to get out of oil, 
will have to plan the implementation of low carbon transition industrial policies under energy and material constraints by famine or fouls. And in Europe, under also constraints of technical and industrial skills since after 1973, Europe chose to de-industrialize by looking elsewhere for the abundant cheap energy it lacked, necessar the energy necessary, necessary to take over from its flagging economic growth, China's coal, for instance. Our wager should now be the following, according to us at the SHIP project, that the first nation, or group of nations, hopefully, to draw the full consequences of the extremely perilous situation in which we find ourselves will go down in history forever by winning the future. It's going to be very tough. But then that's the nature of any historic ch historical challenge, is it not? The only antidote to the cacophony and tension generated everywhere by the vit vital issues of energy transition, and often for very similar reasons, this antidote is an adult democratic conversation. For my part, I see this challenge as a kind of a teenager crisis for our modern technical societies, which are arguably quite young, actually, only seven or eight generations since its birth at the time of the Industrial Revolution, the dawn of the fossil age. It's also going to be very hard because we've lost a lot of time, roughly one generation actually, since the first agreement to reduce our CO2 emissions was signed in Kyoto in 1997. Since then, we have not only, we have not really achieved much, We've procrastinated a lot, and we've made a lot of mistakes with therapy, I believe. On the scale of our societies, a generation is perhaps the time it takes for youth to happen, as we say in France, in French, pour que jeunesse se passe. The time needed for the young adult to take stock of his teenager crisis and choose the ways and means to truly become an adult. I believe there are reasons for hope and determination. I consider it a very encouraging news to see the recent emergence, both in France and within Europe, within Western Europe to be precise, of the notion of sufficiency, or what is more and more commonly referred in French debates as structural sobriety. What does it mean? Quite simply, to transform our technical systems, which are like the vital organs of our societies, agriculture, industry, of course, but also, for instance, our health system, which generates in France roughly uh, almost 10% of, the, of uh, CO2 emissions, so that those vital organs perform their, their vital functions much more sparingly in terms of energy and materials but not necessarily in many cases in terms of jobs and skills. And there's certainly good news here too, if we act consistently and boldly. The very emergence of this notion of sufficiency or structural sobriety is the result of a largely objectifiable observation. And it means to me that the largely objective of obje objectifiable nature of the problem posed by our dependence on fossil fuels is probably one or maybe our one and only lifeline, our best chance of salvation. Ecology is first and foremost a science and political ecology has to speak in the name of science. The, frag the fragile acceleration in the growth of renewables energies in Europe and elsewhere in the world. And I believe the rehabilitation of nuclear power in some countries are also good news. But this good news on the technical front won't be able to get to the bottom of it. For the primary reason, 
I've already mentioned, no alternative to oil is likely to be able to compete with it at the same level of consumption we know today. That is to say, technology won't save us, at least not just by itself. The answers to the fossil fuel exit equation cannot be purely technical. They are necessarily social, technical, and necessarily, and they, 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 necess I'm sorry, they necessarily involve the notion of sobriety in terms of energy and materials. Where danger grows, that which saves also grows. That's a quote, famous quote from the German poet Holderlin. To end this speech, I'd like to emphasize the, geo the geopolitical dangers we are facing. Our century, which is supposed to be the century to, uh, of the exit from oil, began with a war probably motivated by the control of oil in Iraq in 2003. The Bush administration and Dick Cheney in particular were all too aware at that time of the deadly consequences for the sustainability of American economic power of the inexorable decline of conventional oil production which started in the US in the year 1970 just three years before the fatidic 1973 oil shock. And believe me, there's a strong link here, even though I'm not, it's not the, the time and place to, to develop it. Suffice to say that at that time, a member of the Nixon cabinet, of the Nixon government, remarked, in view of the unexpected decline in Texas crude extraction, Popeye is running out of cheap spinach. Maybe you remember Popeye, you know, Popeye the Sailor Man. Okay, rings a bell for the, for the, for the oldest in the, in the room. I leave you for a moment to ponder the meaning of this expression and its implications. Popeye is running out of cheap spinach. Before he came upon shale oil, Popeye has tried for 25 years to find cheap spinach all around the Persian Gulf. The Iron Gate and chemical bombings during the Iran-Iraq War of the 80s, the Gulf War in, 19, in 1991, the embargo on Iraq in the 90s, and then and finally the final catastrophe of the invasion of Iraq in 2003, are m some of the many scars left behind by Popeye's nightmarish quest for cheap spinach. Today, Having produced for the CHIP project a series of studies on the security of Europe's oil and gas supplies under the aegis of the French Ministry of Armed Forces, some of whose conclusions I presented across the street over there at the Ecole de Guerre uh, before the French Chief of Staff, I am convinced, convinced that Vladimir Putin's tactic of exerting ex ex maximum economic pressure on Europe's gas supplies simply sees the, the strategic opportunity offered by the decline and in fact the drain up of the North Sea's oil, oil and gas reserves. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but the, the production of oil and gas in, no, in, the, in the North Sea has been declining for now more than 20 years. Western Europe has neglected to draw the, the physical and technical consequences of this situation, not only the industrial consequences, but also geostrategic of the drying up of the North Sea. We are all facing at the ship project what we call a double carbon constraint. It means we have not just one, but two excellent and cumulative reasons to be deadly serious about our collective commitment to get rid of fossil fuels. The first reason is downstream from our technical systems is global warming, of course. But the second, system, the second reason lays upstream. Unfortunately, it's much less, much less talked about, yet it's much simpler to understand. It lays in the drying up of the number of major hydrocarbon sources on which Europe heavily depends on today. In the North Sea, in all Africa, 
and tomorrow in Russia, which is today one of the major mature producers on the verge of decline. To conclude, I'd like to paraphrase Lady Margaret Thatcher with an undisguised irony. Tina, there is no alternative, no alternative to structural sobriety, to sufficiency. And we must be the generation that will invent it. Like Ulysses, we are destined to sail the perilous strait through Caridis and Scylla to find our homeland intact. I thank you very much for listening to me. <laughs>